<laughs> Welcome to the Green Nurse Podcast, where we bring hope and inspiration for growth and healing. We're here to change the dialogue and stigma around what it means to feel good or be high. Hence the H for hope, I for inspiration, G for growth, and H for healing. You deserve to feel good. We all deserve to feel good. And before we get started on our very, very special interview today, here is a little video about what we do in the cannabis space as nurses. Change the paradigm of healthcare. The Green Nurse is a holistic cannabis nurse that teaches on the endocannabinoid system and the safe utilization of cannabis and other progressive tools to help people reach a better quality of life. I'm the founder of Holistic Caring. We're based here in California and we do educational programs and case management for patients on how to use cannabis therapeutically as a medicine. We're also here to decrease stigma around what it means to feel good and be high, hence the H for hope, I for inspiration, G for growth, and H for healing. As the founder of Holistic Caring, I basically over, oversee the, the whole ship. And what we're doing is uh, progressive education. Cannabis actually supports all 11 organ systems, our immune system, and all the neurotransmitter signaling systems that give messages to tell our body to either do something or not do something. Because the plant was prohibited, it prevented health professionals, doctors, and nurses from learning about cannabis as medicine. I want to change the paradigm of healthcare and us paving the way into a new vanguard of medicine. It's about education, it's about empowerment, it's about teaching people how to feel good, bridging the gap from what they're not getting from traditional medicine, utilizing different plant medicines, adaptogens, tips, tricks, hugs, and nugs of information to support and nourish the most important system in our body. And it's a lot of soul work, a lot of love, a lot of discipline, and meditation. I'm using my life work as a testimony to others to learn how they can be their own hero and then go help heal the world. And we are, as nurses, the game changers. Oh, there you go. Growing your health, nice. growing cannabis. Hey, everyone. My name is Sherry yeah. Mack, and I'm president of nursing, co-founder of Holistic Caring and the Green Nurse. I'm a cannabis nurse, patient, advocate, ac activist, and as you all know, a very passionate podcaster here to change the paradigm of healthcare with my, my friend here, Elizabeth. <laughs> I'm really too excited to announce this seventh year podcasting with Green Nurse, Living Your Best Life started podcasting in 2018 when the National Council of State Boards of Nursing came out with the guidelines that all nurses must have six essential areas of knowledge when it comes to cannabis as medicine. Started podcasting to share compelling stories of healing, to decrease stigma, since I too use cannabis as medicine. But before we get started on our very, very excited show, we have a message from our sponsors at Bloom Hemp. Elizabeth, Okay, so uh, Bloom Hemp is a woman and nurse owned national CBD supplier leading with quality, safety, value, and patient centered care. Bloom Hemp products are tested for quality, uh, safety, uh, and, and uh, uh, cannabinoid and terpene profiles, uh, grown in the mountains of Colorado, and is one of the only CBD companies that has a free nurse line. So if you want to talk to a nurse, call 970 404 HOPE 4673. And uh, don't forget to use your coupon Green Nurse for 10% off and free shipping. There we go. There you go. And we are back <laughs> and really excited to announce the First Lady of Cannabis, Alice O'Leary Randall. <laughs> <laughs> Alice, I gotta do a proper. <laughs> Alice O'Leary Randall, yes. along with her yes. husband, Robert C. Randall, played a pioneering role in the medical cannabis movement starting in 1976. I was 10 years old then. Robert was the first person in the United States to legally receive medical cannabis for over two decades. Alice and Robert dedicated themselves tirelessly to challenging the prohibitions surrounding cannabis. 
And following Robert's untimely passing in 2001, Alice transitioned into the field of hospice nursing and later became a grief counselor. After retiring from nursing in 2012, Alice reimmersed herself in the medical cannabis arena. She actively writes and speaks on the subject, having worked closely with Denver's Mary Medicinals for five years. In 2015, mm -hmm. she developed the informative cannabis primer series, followed by Mary's Prime Time in 2017. Alice has served on the board of directors for the American Cannabis Nurses Association as an advisor for United in Compassion, an Australian medical cannabis organization. Alice is also an accomplished author with notable works, including Medical Marijuana in America, a memoir of a pioneer published in 2014. She's written Pain Free with CBD, one of my first books in 2019, and her most recent publication, an e-publication volume titled Marijuana Rx, The Early Days, 1976 to 1996. The story of American medical marijuana movement provides valuable insights into the origins of this movement. Alice, welcome to the show. You have no idea how grateful I am to have you on the show to share some of the missing historical information on medical cannabis. So thank you so much for being on this oh, show yeah. and not giving up. You're welcome, Sherry and Elizabeth. Nice to see you both. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you yeah. for coming on. So you've been quite busy for the past 40 years <laughs> trying to change. <laughs> trying to change you might law. say that. <laughs> yeah. Closer yeah. to 50, actually. But yes, it, it has been a busy time. Has been a very busy time. Well worth yeah. it, though. I'd do it again. <laughs> so, so, Alice, yeah. as I was preparing for this interview, you know, I, 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 I've read your book. I went to your website, which I'm going to share with our viewers. We've had some dialoguing back and forth. I went to your YouTube channel and I found a video on Good Morning America mm -hmm. of Robert. Uh, mm, uh huh. What do you think? Oh, he was young then. Yours. <laughs> oh, I think it, I always like to see Robert. So I think that'd be fun. Um, I think he's the cutest did, thing ever. So let's let's see what was, Robert has. Um, this, was, this was actually his first national TV interview. Uh, he wow. had, it was in January 77, he'd had legal marijuana for about two and a half months at this point. So, or, or almost three. All so, right, here yeah. we go. Let's We're do show, it. Show the clip. Here we go. Okay. Okay. Plenty of right now. Robert Randall is in a very unusual court case. He has glaucoma, which is an eye disease that can cause blindness. He found that smoking marijuana helped his sight better than what the doctors prescribed for him, so he asked the government for permission to use the drug legally. But before the permission was granted, uh, he was arrested for possession of marijuana, and the judge in Washington, D.C. dismissed the case because Mr. Randall was using the drug to keep him going blind. Good morning. Good morning. Nice to have you with us this morning. Thank you. You won the case, and the government provides your marijuana. How does this work? What's the, the system? Well, the... Uh there, there are two separate cases obviously involved. One was the petition, mm -hmm. which was directed against the federal government and was merely a request for legal access to quality controlled marijuana. Uh, that came through, and so now I'm receiving the marijuana from the government. But uh, two weeks after that, the court case was decided. Right. And uh, the court case said that my need for marijuana constituted a necessity and the government could not infringe on that need. So uh, the government and growing, are you, are you part really of a research project of some kind or is this, well, this is, totally separated? Well, this is the distinction. Yeah. The uh, bureaucratic solution. In other words, uh, the only way the bureaucracies could politically provide me with the marijuana because there's a law against use of marijuana was by making me a research subject, creating an entire research program for me. And that's been done in Washington, D.C. But of course, that has certain drawbacks to it. It seems like a privilege. Mm -hmm. uh, there are two million people, at the very minimum in this country, who have glaucoma. And uh, marijuana would appear to be effective medication on the basis of tests run by the government. Yeah, I'm going to get into that a little bit later, by the okay. way, because we've got a statement from the doctor at UCLA that I'm going to read later on that subject. Mm -hmm. How much do you smoke? Right now I'm smoking between five and eight joints a day. Now, I, I don't happen to smoke, mm -hmm. so I don't know what that 
really would do to you. Are you high all the time? What kind of an effect no, does it have I, on you? I, I think the problem that people have with marijuana is that it's a smoke drug, so they relate it to tobacco, and it makes you high, or it allows you to become high, so they relate it to alcohol. Uh, it's much different than that. The high that you get from marijuana is very self-induced, almost. Uh, it has very little to do with the drug and a great deal to do with your expectation. So if you here's... expect to get high, you'll get high. In other words, you feel... Very Com comfortable. Comfortable yes. and normal all the time. Can you function? Uh, yes, quite well. Well, mm -hmm. what's, what's glaucoma? Uh, it's an eye disease where uh, fluid builds up in the eye. There's, there's fluid in the eye to maintain the shape of the eye, and the fluid simply builds up and impacts the optic nerve, causing the nerve to die. Right. And so the marijuana... Yes, all, all conventional the therapy is to bring the pressure in the eye down. Right. So that you don't have that impact against the optic nerve. Yeah. Was there, at your trial, was there medical testimony? Yes, there was. There was medical testimony from uh, physicians at UCLA mm -hmm. who had for five years researched marijuana's relationship to eye pressure. Mm -hmm. And then there was medical testimony from my own doctor of four years in Washington. Yeah. Where, where do you smoke? I mean, would you smoke, for instance, this morning here? It's or? a little early to smoke yet. Uh, <laughs> my medication schedule would uh, about four a... hours after I wake up. Yeah. yeah. And you're on a regular schedule? Mm hmm Just like any medication. Hey, let me read that statement, by the way, uh, from Dr. Sidney Cohen, who was the investigator uh, yes. at the UCLA Project, Marijuana Project in California. Dr. Cohen told us yesterday on the phone, quote, most patients who have glaucoma benefit from the conventional medications which are available. For those few who do not, uh, marijuana, the act or PHC, the active ingredient in marijuana, could provide some help. However, it is still an investigational drug and not available for general use, unquote. I'm, I'm reading this only yes. because we certainly cannot endorse uh, yeah, people certainly. because of the people you mentioned. There are a lot of people with glaucoma whom mm -hmm. I assume should see their doctors, should they not, and discuss it? They should, but one of the great problems in the entire area is that the medical profession really does have very little knowledge on marijuana. Uh, the mm -hmm. law has disallowed research in marijuana. The law prevents... Uh, for instance, there's no reason for a doctor to learn about an illegal substance. He's mm -hmm. never going to have to use it. And so you end up with doctors knowing as little as the general population. What are the broadest implications of this case of yours, do you think? Well, I think the broadest ones are that it blatantly shows that the law, that something is seriously wrong with the law. Had I paid attention to that law, been an obedient citizen, believed that the legislators were acting in my best interest, I'd now be blind. You would be now? Yes. Are you blind and either or I'm uh, or partially blind in or this eye, yes, and partially blind in this eye. Are you worried about going blind now? Uh, well, I think you always worry about going blind. I don't think I there's a point so. where you quit, but uh, <laughs> it is obvious that the marijuana seems to be stabilizing the condition. It does? Yes. So you're not as concerned as you were before? I'm not nearly as concerned as I was before, especially having uh, access to a drug which is now controlled in quality. Mm -hmm. When you're dealing with street marijuana, of course, you don't have that. In the vernacular, they, you hear the term good stuff. Does the government go grow, grow good stuff? It does, yeah. It does? Yeah. So you have high quality. A high quality marijuana, which is consistently controlled. What yes. do you recommend, uh, you know, based on your experience, and you've become obviously very articulate in this whole area, even concerning the legal ramifications, what, what do you recommend the government do uh, for well, your personal? I'm very fearful that people will think that a solution has been found. Uh, of course, a solution has been found for me, but it hasn't been found for other people with glaucoma or other people with conditions that marijuana might help. Uh, I think it would be very dangerous at this point to leave it in the hands of the bureaucracies. I dealt with the bureaucracies. They were as fair to me as possible, but it took six months for me to get a critical medication. Um, and I think that the bureaucracies are in a great deal of trouble and confused. I think what needs to be done is the Congress needs to review the law itself. So Congress has to get involved and yes, I think Congress see what's does. Going on. I think they'd rather not, but I think it's time they that they do. To. Thank you, Mr. Randall. Thank you very much for being with us this morning. Forty-six after right now. We'll be back with uh, really a throwback to the past, a bounty hunter after these. <laughs> That's my guy. <laughs> uh, mm. Wow. He, how does that make you feel, Alice? Because I'll tell you, when I was watching him and I was looking at the photos and I was looking through your memorabilia, I'm, I'm telling you, my mm. heart was so full. Mm. Well, like, my heart is yeah. <laughs> very, very full. Um, 
you know, he, uh, it's wonderful to see him so young again and, and relatively healthy. And uh, um, what, what I love about that clip in 77 is you can put it up against the one where he, 10 years later, where he's on Larry King, the, the top, the, it's exactly the same. He was so on point at the very beginning and it never wavered. You know, it was always about this is wrong. Other people need it just like I do. And when are they going to get around to changing this? It just, it never wavered. Um, he was remarkable in that, re in that regard. Um, and he had a wonderful sense of humor and he was just a terrific guy with a, with a very big heart, very big heart. Yeah, I, that, that was the first, I did not see that uh, Sherry was preparing. So um, that was the first time I saw that clip and he was ah. very articulate, very smart, very well-spoken, yes. very informed. Yes, wow. yes. Well, he had a master's degree in rhetoric, which is the art of public persuasion. Okay. So there, there, there could not have been a better person to uh, tap on the shoulder and say, hey, go out and solve this problem. Um, wow. he, he, was ex he was exceptionally articulate. Very much so. Yeah. He, he was wow. a wonderful man, truly. Oh, so, amazing. Well, what did he yeah. do with his career? What, what was he working in? Uh, he was a college professor when we were um, busted in August of 1975. Um, he was teaching at a, a nearby junior college. Uh, he hoped to be a speechwriter. That's why he came to Washington, D.C. Uh, and yeah. uh, he ended up driving a cab instead. <laughs> As, as things happen, uh, and it's while he was driving the cab that he realized his vision really was terrible. That's uh, that was and, a good uh, question. Like, when did yeah, when did he realize that he had a problem with mm -hmm. his eyes? Because glaucoma treatment back then, like as we discussed, wasn't as advanced mm -hmm. as it is today. Just drop. No, not not at all. And actually, Robert, um, in our book, he talks about sitting in an optometrist's office when he's about seventeen years old and picking up a pamphlet called Glaucoma, the Sneak Thief of Sight. And he read this brochure and, and he said, gosh, that sounds like what, I, what I'm going through. And he showed it to the optometrist and the optometrist just blew him off. He said, oh, don't be silly, son. Only old people get glaucoma. You're way too young to get glaucoma. Well, the fact of the matter is you can be born with glaucoma, uh, which Robert probably was. The, the real problems probably began manifesting when he was in his early teens. And, um, but, you know, only old people get glaucoma. <laughs> so he was 24 when he was diagnosed. Um, okay. And, and that you, was in Washington. How did, and Alice, how did you meet, how did you meet him? How did you meet Robert? Uh, well, Robert and I met in college in, in Florida. We both grew up in Sarasota. Um, and, um, our paths crossed a couple of times. We worked at the same, um, amateur theater together. Um, we lived in the same neighborhood for a while, but we didn't really meet until we went to junior college, um, in Bradenton, Florida, and then on to the university of South Florida in Tampa. Okay. Yeah. Great. And so mm -hmm. how, how did he discover cannabis? Like, you know, yeah. you know, we know it's back in the seventies and, you know, cannabis. sixties, sixties. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. How, how did we score cannabis? Was that the question? How did he uh, score? Discover. How did he discover? <laughs> okay. uh, discover. Oh, um, you know, that's, that's very interesting because all through college, whenever we would have marijuana, I, I noticed Robert, you know, we'd be smoking and he'd be doing this you know, with his eyes. And he was seeing, he was noticing the difference when he smoked that he could, he could see better. Uh, but he never put the pieces together. And then when he moved to Washington, D.C., the connections dried up. He had no marijuana for many months. Uh, and that's when the, the glaucoma became very aggressive because he wasn't medicating. And that's what sent him to the ophthalmologist and then a friend, a newfound friend in Washington one night gave him a joint and he took it home and he, he was getting ready to smoke the joint. He looked out the window and there were halos around streetlights, which was a sign that his pressure was elevated. So he just, you know, let out a heavy sigh, got himself a big glass of Coca-Cola. He loved Coca-Cola, sat down to listen to some music, smoked the joint, got up a little while later to go back to the kitchen, looked out the window, the halos were gone. 
And in our book, he talks about this being a seminal moment. He knew immediately what had happened. And he talks about it in, in such terms that it's like he knows about the ECS, but he doesn't know. You, you know what I mean? He he feels this thing happening inside of him, but of course the science it would be another 20 years before we discovered the endogenous cannabinoid system. So he was just going on feelings and instinct, but he knew at that moment that marijuana was helping him. And then he went, ah oh, no, I gotta be stoned. That can't be real. But the thought wouldn't go away. And he kept testing it and he kept testing it. He told me about it. I laughed. I, I thought that was the funniest thing I'd ever marijuana as a medicine. Sure, Bobby. Right. You know, um, but, it, you know, there was no marijuana, medical marijuana in the 1970s. Harry Onslinger and all of his gang there, the DEA, they didn't do very good about stopping recreational marijuana, but they did a real good job about stopping medical marijuana. And, and so it just didn't exist in the American consciousness. But it did not take me long to realize that, yeah, it really was helping him. You could see it in the way he moved. He was more confident in the way he moved and he could read better. Um, it became very obvious. And so then, then we did everything we could to keep ourselves in supply of marijuana. And uh, that wasn't always easy. And you, did you, and you grew it, correct? That's how he ended up growing? Yeah. Yeah, we had four plants growing on our sun deck and, um, and through a a simple twist of fate, really. Um, we we got busted. We actually weren't there. We had gone out to Indiana to visit some friends. We came home. Our house was ransacked. Um, we thought we must have been robbed. <laughs> and then we found the search warrant on the kitchen table, with a with a little scribble thing saying "Turn yourself in." Um, I mean, it was. I look back on it now. It, it, it's hysterical. Um, <laughs> but it, it you know at the exactly. time it. It turned our lives upside down, truly. It did. So, so did yeah. you turn yourselves in, or so, did they come course. back? Okay. <laughs> no, they did not come back. No, we turned ourselves in. Um, and at that at that time, we met our lawyer. Um, I knew like one lawyer in Washington at the time. I called him up. He came down to the arraignment with us. Bob told him on that day. He said, "Paul, I use marijuana to treat my glaucoma, to treat my eye disease. What should I do about that?" And Paul, God bless him, he 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 stifled that laugh that he wanted to, to. So he just had this lawyerly smirk on his face and said, "Well, Bobby, prove it." Well, Bobby mm -hmm. did. <laughs> so, and that's how that's how we got started. We we got some some information from Normal that, and and it had some information from the National Institute on Drug Abuse, and that gave us some avenues to explore, and. Um, and so we, we did, and, and pretty soon we were really immersed in the whole issue, truly. Yeah. So in 1976, he became the first person to gain legal medical access to cannabis. Mm -hmm. tell, tell me the story. That's about correct. How did that come about? Well, it was really a two pronged situation. Um, we'd been arrested. Obviously, we were facing charges. We could have, we could have paid, a, I think, a $250 fine because it was really just a misdemeanor charge. Um, but we decided to fight it. And, and the lawyers that we had, they were they got excited about it. They could see right away that this could be a, a, a case that um, if we could prove it, which Bobby did, um, we could, they could really go somewhere. So we had the criminal case and then we also had a civil case. We filed a petition with the National Institute on Drug Abuse, the FDA and the DEA uh, asking permission to use their supplies of marijuana to treat Robert's glaucoma. We were very fortunate we were able to get Robert into the UCLA study uh, that was run by Dr. Robert Hepler. And it was, it, was almost be, it was almost on the verge of shutting down when Robert called Dr. Hepler. But we got, we got him in. Um, Normal paid for his fare to go out to California. And he was in Cal he was at UCLA for ten days. They tr they treated him with every possible combination of conventional glaucoma medications. Uh, they tried THC capsules, and they tried smoked marijuana. 
The only thing that worked was a combination of the, con the conventional medications, drops, eye drops, and the marijuana. Conventional medications alone didn't work. Marijuana alone didn't work. You put them together, Robert was able to save his sight. Wow. So we mm -hmm. had that information to go to court with, and, mm -hmm. and we did, and we prevailed. So That's, It's wonderful, yeah. thank that that normal pitched in and helped him get to California and knew about the trial and, and got him in and got that data to then go back into the courtroom, which influenced everything. Exactly. That that. Yeah. Right. And not only the courtroom, but also the National Institute on Drug Abuse. They looked at this data. There was there was no denying this data. Uh, marijuana was critical to Robert's eyesight. Well, you know, None of those agencies ever expected somebody, a single individual, to walk up to their door and go, excuse me, I, I need marijuana medically. You know, they were all prepared for onslaughts from normal and, and any other you know, any other organization you can think of and lawyers and all that. They had never considered the power of a single individual coming in and saying, I have incontrovertible proof that I need marijuana. What are you going to do about it? <laughs> They had to act affirmatively, um, but they made very clear, made very clear that um, nobody else was going to get through that way. They, they weren't happy about it, but there wasn't, there wasn't much they could do, frankly. There really wasn't. They tried hard, but there wasn't anything they could do. So. Yeah. Well, and that's what I so love about, you know, investigating the historical aspect of what Robert and you did is you guys, you know, you were able to get him medical cannabis from the government. I want you to share that story of how he has it mailed to him. Mm -hmm. And then you continue to fight for other patients to get cannabis because it, it, that's mm -hmm. incredible. You know, I mean, he, yeah. he didn't stop. He didn't stop helping people and neither did you. And I just, no, oh. no, he did. Well, you know, when, when, when we first got arrested, we, we really pulled inward. You know, we, we didn't think anybody else knew about marijuana as medicine. We thought this was something we had discovered all on our own, you know? And then after the arrest to discover that the National Institute on Drug Abuse had been doing these tests, well, it, it made us angry. And, and so we, we decided, okay, let's try to get it for Bob. Well, once it became obvious that we were going to succeed doing that, then we start to look around us um, and the publicity in the case started and we immediately, immediately started getting letters from other people saying, Hey, I, I live in Maryland and, and I have MS and, and I noticed when I smoke marijuana, it seems to help me too. And, or, you know, a glaucoma patient from, you know, somewhere else. I mean, we, we immediately started hearing from people. The government would have liked nothing better for Robert to take the marijuana, quietly go back to his teaching, not tell anybody else about it, but we couldn't do that. There were too many other people that it was obvious they needed this, just like Robert did. And um, I think we, we were both raised as uh, people who we believed in the American way. We believed that if you proved your case and walked up to agencies, they'd be there to help you. And that, you know, that, that initial naivete, <laughs> Um, got us started. And then, um, you know, the rest just, we just kept going. We just kept going. So. Yeah. Well, yeah. It, and, and that, that whole impetus that, that, that happened to me too, right? When I crashed my bicycle at the end mm -hmm. of 2014, I was introduced to CBD at my chiropractor's office as a, as a topical uh -huh. uh, and ended up taking CBD internally with some capsules that I was able to buy. And I started to heal. And then I started to heal mm -hmm. from not only the injury, but but everything else that was wrong with me for 20 years. And I said, if I can help myself, I have to help others. And it, it's it's mm -hmm. a natural inclination it is. Uh, uh, for, for people I, like uh, us. I think it is. Yes, uh, I, I think I think it is. Yeah. And I remember, too, when mm -hmm. I first started, it was interesting because it was a 70 year old nurse that came to my house when I was sick and suffering mm -hmm. on 18 pharmaceuticals and couldn't take care of my kids and couldn't work, came to my house and she mm -hmm. brought me a job. She was a nurse. She was actually a nurse at college in Massachusetts. And her father mm -hmm. was a pharmacist who actually carried cannabis in his pharmacy prior to 1937. So she came to my wow. house and she, she held up the joint. She goes, Sherry, get with the program. She goes, cannabis <laughs> is 
years old. I looked at her at the joint and I go, what are you kidding me? You're bringing me weed? Like, how is this going to help? <laughs> she did. She disclosed. She goes, Sherry, I want to tell you something. I've been using cannabis every day since I was 17. That's 53 years <laughs> using cannabis. Just a little bit. I'm not on any pharmaceuticals and I've never been hospitalized. And as a matter of fact, my father carried it in his pharmacy. Yeah. There you go. Up. Had to. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Sure. Sure. Well, and, nurses and, are the most trustworthy, you know. Yeah. 22 years in a row. Uh, and I, and I yeah, love, right. I don't know where we are in the questions, but I, I love what you said about the DEA was very successful at shutting down medical cannabis, obviously not recreational because people still right. had it, but shutting right. down medical cannabis. Uh, that oh. is that you speak to that. Yeah, that is, yeah. that's, well, it, it, I mean, Harry Onslinger clearly set out to do that, and he got it removed from the pharmacopoeia. Uh, he made it, you, you know, the 1937 Tax Act said that doctors could still use it, but then they made the system so convoluted that it was just impossible to, to get easily. I mean, we didn't have faxes then. We didn't have email. You had to fill out all these forms, take them to the post office, send them, wait, they would send it back, say, no, you need to do it this way. You know, I mean, the same old runaround, but with with none of the technology. Um, but he just, I, he was, well, Harry Onslinger, let's not go there, because I could spend an hour talking about Harry Onslinger. But it, he was clearly trying to shut that reputable use of this uh, plant down. And he did a very good job of it. And there were so many other new medications, exciting medications coming down the pipeline, you know, the penicillins, the sulfur drugs, the, the antibiotics. It, you can't blame the, the medical profession for being distracted, shall we say. Um, but you can see the I think some, sorry? You can see sorry. the corruption, the influence of, of pharmaceuticals and, and you know, yes. pain medications yes. as opposed to using something that's more natural because, you know, we, yeah. we specifically Word naivete, did he really think that the recreational use was going to be shut down? Like in Reefer Madness, where people were just enjoying it. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, you know, it's 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 not a good thing to go too far into Harry Onslinger's mind, I think. Um, but, you know, he, um, he really did a number on the medical use uh, side. And when I think of the years of, of lost research, you know, those 40, 50 years there where we just you know, there was just nothing happening with this plant. Whereas I know in Czechoslovakia in the 1950s, they were looking into it. They were making a whole uh, compendium of plants with medicinal use. And that's that's one country where um, some study continued to go on. So study was continuing. It, it's not like it, cannabis, medical cannabis disappeared into to the ethers entirely, but it was so, it, you know, oh, it's just folklore. It's just, it's just folk medicine. That's, that's the term I remember, folk medicine, you know? Well, yeah, you bet. <laughs> it's, it's folk medicine <laughs> and the folks should have it um, for sure. sure. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so in 1978, you started working for Normal and established the Medical Classification Project. Tell us about mm -hmm. that. Yeah, um, that was that was a fun period for me, actually. We were hearing from so many people and we were trying to answer them all. And we didn't we didn't have a lot of money at that point. And we went to Normal and said, hey, could we and Normal was very good. I mean, we would write we would write letters to people and take them down to Normal and Normal would post them for us. I mean, we just and and they would help out with pub um, printing costs and that kind of stuff. Um, so eventually it became it became obvious. Let's go to Normal and see if they'd hire us. Well, they, they wanted Robert, <laughs> most of all, but Robert, Robert was not a, no, he wasn't an organizational guy. He would not have fit in there at all. Um, so we offered me and um, I started there in January of 78, which um, it, 1978 was a pretty eventful year. Um, that was the year that New Mexico first passed, passed the first law. Um, there was a young man in California by the name of Craig Reichardt who had a judge order the local sheriff to deliver cannabis to this young man with cancer. Um, there were th there were four states total in this in that year of 1978, and the medical reclassification project was just right in the middle of it because everybody knew normal, 
So they'd call normal and say, hey, we need information. And they say, well, hold on, here's Alice. Um, so it was just just the perfect point. And, you know, Robert and I, we were a very good, we were a good partnership. I, I enjoyed doing all that kind of organizational work. Robert, no, <laughs> not so much. Um, so it worked out really well um, for me and, and for the movement, I think. Uh, I was there for three years, and that was during the period of time when the states were passing what were, was con called the um, Controlled Substances Therapeutic Research Act. And there, in the end, we had like 34 states that enacted this type of legislation. The idea being that the state would conduct research using the federal government's uh, marijuana supplies. And we thought, this is great. The, the government wants research. We can give them research. Um, it's, you know, controlled by the states. And, uh, and then, whoo, five years, we'll be, everything will be legalized. It'll be great. Well, it didn't really work out that way. Um, you know, the government did not want, it turns out the government did not want research. Not really. No, no, not really. No. Um, but for that period of time, for that three years, it was the medical reclassification project was, was kind of the center point um, for people looking for information, either individuals or states. And uh, I learned a lot. It was a, it was a great experience for me. And normal was very helpful uh, all along the way. Um, we we had our our good times and our bad times with them, um, but for the most part, they were very supportive, and they they deserve to to be recognized for that. And I'm I'm sure you saw a lot of political shifting at that time, right? We all know 1970, the Controlled mm -hmm. Substance Act, Richard Nixon, yeah, was, you know, Carter and Ford and Reagan. How did that influence? Yeah. Well, you know, you mentioned Carter. Carter was for decriminalization. Um, right. So so when he came into office, that was in 76. I mean, that was the year that Robert got his, his marijuana. Um, he was Carter was elected in 76 and then came into office in 77. So we thought, hey, this is great. You know, mm -hmm. surely, surely President Carter will would be in favor of this. Bob at one point wrote to his drug advisor, who was a man by the name of Peter Bourne, Robert thought that Dr. Bourne would would help him because the federal the agencies were really pressuring Bob, um, telling him, you know, you either shut up, or we take your supplies away. Wow. They were, you know, oh yeah, yeah, they were really, and so Bob wrote to Dr. Bourne, the advisor to the President of the United States, thinking, well, I'm not going to thinking he'd stand up and say, well, we're not going to stand for this. Well, Dr. Bourne wrote back and said, you know, Bob, if you don't shut up, they're going to take your supplies away. Seriously, he did. Um, so, you know, that Robert knew right away, okay, so you're you're threatening my right to freedom of speech by taking away my critical medicine. I mean, it was a tremendously foolish move on the part of the advisor to the president. Um, but Robert just kind of kept that letter quietly to himself for a while. And then it came in handy in 1978, they managed, they being the federal government, managed to lure away Robert's doctor from Washington, DC. Doctor, his name was Dr. Merritt. He moved to North Carolina. Robert couldn't find another doctor. What a surprise. I mean, no doctor wanted to go near this case, right? Uh, so Robert's supplies were taken away in 1978, beginning of 1978. Um, and that letter from the presidential drug advisor became the cornerstone in a civil suit, Randall versus the United States, which was in May of 1978. And it was that case that established the Compassionate IND program, which allowed a dozen or so, at one point we were up to close to 20 people receiving supplies of federal marijuana for medical use for a wide variety of ailments. So what seemed like a, a terrible thing when the government took Robert's medicine away, in the end turned out to be a pretty good thing because we were able to get other people into the program and start building, building, building. It was always a process of building one brick on the other, you know. So. Yeah. 
and we're still building. <laughs> yes, you are. <laughs> Good luck, <Yeah>. kids. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So fast forward to the 1990s. How did the okay. AIDS impact medical cannabis reform? HIV and AIDS. Uh, yeah. HIV yeah. and AIDS. Wow, what a time. Um, Brownie Mary, I, I asked um, you about you had met her. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I, I've met, of course I met Brownie. Uh, I've met Mary. Um, Mary Rathburn. But Mary Rathburn. But um, Mary and, and Dennis and, and those folks were on the West Coast. We were on the East Coast. Um, you know, we had we, we started an organization called the Alliance for Cannabis Therapeutics. That was in 1980. And as early as 1983, we started receiving phone calls from AIDS patients who said, you know, when I use marijuana, I feel so much better. And, and Bob would say, hey, well, why don't we get you, we'll, we'll get you a compassionate IND. We'll, we'll get you legal marijuana. No, 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 I, I'm, I don't have time for that. I just wanted you to know that marijuana is important to people with AIDS. We had one young man who called us. He had been tracking um, when he had marijuana and when he didn't, what his T cell counts were. When he had marijuana, his T cell counts went up. When he didn't have marijuana, they went down. And he said, I, I don't, something's going on with my immune system in marijuana. He said, I, I just want you to know that. Hmm. But they, it, not, it was so, it was such an awful time because AZT was the only medicine they had. It wasn't very effective. And, and people were just dying, dying, dying. They didn't have the time to make the fight. Finally, one patient in um, 1989, his name was Steve. He lived in Texas and he, he set out to find us. He knew that we existed somewhere. He had AIDS, he contracted it from a dirty needle. Um, and he wanted to get marijuana legally because he knew it was helping him feel better and he knew it was important to AIDS. So he tracked us down. We were able to get him into the Compassionate IND program. And that started, the, he, he was very keen on, I wanna make news. I wanna get this story out to others. So we made news for him and we got the story out. And Steve died, let's see, Steve died in uh, February of 1990. High Times Magazine called not long after Steve's death and said, wow, this is really an interesting story. Uh, would, you write him, would you write an obituary? Bob said, of course I will. So wrote an obituary. It got into the April issue of High Times. And in, Be in Panama City Beach, Florida, there was a young couple by the name of Barbara and Kenny Jenks who were just getting out of jail. They had been arrested for growing some marijuana. I think they had three plants in the back bedroom of their, their trailer in Panama City Beach. And Kenny said, I'm going to go to 7-Eleven. I'm going to buy a High Times magazine. We'll find a lawyer. Well, they didn't find a lawyer. What they found was Steve's obituary. Now, they were kind of like Bob and I. They thought they were operating in this quiet little orbit where only they knew it was, you know, helping them. And suddenly their world just exploded. They called Bob. Of course, we helped. We got them into the Compassionate IND program. And then we established a program called the Marijuana AIDS Research Service, which or MARS, which was designed to help all AIDS patients get marijuana legally. Because what we had learned with AIDS was that the, the forms that you had to fill out for the government became remarkably easy. AIDS is such a, a predictable disease and all patients have, for the most part, similar symptoms. Mm -hmm. So you, you create a checklist. Yeah. The patient could sit down with a doctor and within 20 minutes they could complete this, this IND application. And so we had a donor at that point. We had a benefactor by the name of Rich Dennis who flew us to Chicago where we announced it. He had closed circuit TV to AIDS groups all over the country so they could see the announcement of this program. Before the, before the, before the announcement was done, the phone in Washington was ringing and I was picking up this AIDS patient saying, where do I get this? Can you send it out to me today? Hundreds, hundreds and hundreds of people 
sent in this application to FDA. Well, we knew there would be one or two reactions. They'd either open their hearts and be compassionate and expand the compassionate IND program and get, get any AIDS patient who wanted it marijuana, or they'd shut the program down. Mm. They shut the program down. That the was government's in- reaction, that was in 1991, 92. It took them a while to close it down because they said they were going to close it down and people got so upset that they mm-hmm. backed off. Mm-hmm. So um, it was, it, you know, it, there, there is so much cruelty in that time, um, which I'm not going to go into because, but uh, trust me, there was so much cruelty in that time. It was wow. astonishing. So they tried to close the program down and it made people really mad in the, in the period of time between 1976 and 1991, America learned that marijuana has medical value. There were all those States back in the seventies and the, in the early eighties. Um, there was Robert out there talking every chance he could and, you know, word of mouth. Oh, hey, yeah, my Uncle Joe uses that. You know, he says it makes his prostate feel better. Did you know that? I mean, there were all kinds of things going around. And um, America had become very sophisticated with their knowledge about medical marijuana. And when they realized the government was trying to shut down the only legal program for access, Americans, they they didn't take it. So they were very annoyed. And... uh, wrote their congressmen, wrote to their newspapers, newspapers wrote editorials. And out in California, Brownie Mary, Dennis Perone, Scott Imler, so many good people. Um, they said, we, we got to do something about this. So it started with San Francisco passing Prop P, which was just a citywide initiative. Uh, and it really didn't do much other than tell the police not to arrest people using marijuana medically. But that evolved into Prop 215. Mm -hmm. And the rest, as they say, is history. I I like to think of it as the government getting hoisted on their own petard because (laughs) they shut this down and they thought, okay, we got them now. Shut it down. Well, it just exploded. And (laughs) they they blew it good. So. Right. You know, they, they shut down. They shut down the program, benefiting twenty some people. But then they opened up, uh, you know, Pandora's box yes. to, to open That's it up. That's exactly right. And millions. That's exactly right. And and, and exactly it, it, right, Elizabeth. From from just the medical approach for a few to everybody needs access to this. And I love how mm-hmm. I, in 1996 I voted for it. I've been here forever. Uh, <laughs> and you know, I remember everybody, you know, starting to say, "Well, how do I get marijuana?" And, and, and uh-huh. you know, I, I remember, you know, I was a nurse back then and working in hospitals and, you know, we, we would have joints here and there, you know, not not that much. But we lost the fear of uh, of being arrested, really. And, and, mm-hmm. and for the most part, um, we weren't growing or we weren't doing anything like that. And, and there wasn't any dispensaries to speak of. Um, but, right. you know, right. it was it was it's, it was a slow build uh, to just getting some kind of uh, allowability for this plant to exist in the context of Mm -hmm. it makes you feel better and that's all right. Yeah, (laughs) exactly. Exactly right. And of course the DEA tried to shut down those early, Dennis Prone had a a smoking room. I can't remember what he called it, but, but people came there and and there was, there was cannabis available. And so they tried to shut it down in California. They tried when um, Oregon passed their luck, I think the next year or maybe two years, they tried to close those down. I mean, DEA tried to stop it, but it was it was too big at that point. I mean, they they had just stomped on people for so long, but people get tired of being stomped on, mm-hmm. and um, you know they um, they they uh, they had so many opportunities to handle it properly, and they blew every one of them. You know, they just because they they I I don't know they just. Um, they, it's the Harry Onslinger thing. It's all I, I keep, you know, my head just comes back constantly to, he just, right. they couldn't get rid of the ghost of Harry Onslinger. I swear. Yeah. Onslinger, I call him Asslinger. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, That's and, good. And I, I was a CNN junkie for, for a long time. And uh, I watched mm-hmm. all the weed series when they were live back in, mm-hmm. you know, 
Sanjay Gupta started doing that and, and Sherry yeah. and I have been watching them uh, the last uh, week or so uh, in, in preparation for m numerous things she's working on to, to really give that yeah. history. Um, and, you know, we were watching yeah. Jeff Sessions the other day and he could have been, you know, the next Harry Anslinger. It's uh, yeah, it's, he could have. Yeah. It, and, and but, he, you know, you. Yeah, yeah, you bring up that weed documentary. That was so important in 2013, his first one. Mm -hmm. That was the first time America saw a figure of authority stand in front of a camera and say, I was wrong. I yeah. had it wrong. And that that is what America was waiting for. And after he did that show, wow, CBD laws only. I mean, we had those for a while, the CBD only laws, you know. But it just spiked up tremendously. You know, he just, he gave it legitimacy that America had been waiting for that authoritative figure. And it, it turned out to be Sanjay Gupta. Mm -hmm. He was a doctor. He wouldn't lie to us, right? He's a doctor, right. you know, and he's on TV. <laughs> and and uh, uh, the the trajectory of all of these families with Charlotte Figgy leading right and 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 that mm -hmm. way of showing how this was so remarkable from three hundred seizures a week to to one right. or two uh, and then right. all of the other people now why why did the government not because you were you were in history back then not open up another round of the investigation on new drugs and that we're gonna then take the the CBD into the government and right. and they already had a patent on it. I know, I know. It, it's so confusing. Patent number, right? We all know that number. <laughs> yeah, they they just got, you know, the government's just so locked in so many lies, they don't know what they're saying anymore. Um, and, you know, it, I, I, I hope something comes out of this Biden request, but it, it wouldn't surprise me in the least if DEA said, mm, nope, nope but let's hope they won't. Let's hope a request from the president of the United States carries a little more weight than the endless number of petitions they've had from just us common citizens, you know, yeah. let's hope. It, it's been <laughs> petition numerous times to reschedule. Uh, I think uh, at least 10 rescheduling. Oh, now. yes. Yeah. Yeah. And, and we were, for the viewers, we were very involved. For the new people that are listening, let's talk about what's going on with the government because some well, people and, aren't. And what Schedule One is? Yeah, so Schedule One, Elizabeth. Okay, hmm. Schedule One: no medical benefits, highly addictive, dangerous, abusive, and mm -hmm. uh, even under clinical supervision, you can't use it. it right, and we right. know that hypocrisy. Right. You have thirty-eight yeah. states. Yeah, thirty-eight states, twenty-four mm -hmm. with adult use, uh, mm -hmm. and, and the, the 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 ploy now is to reschedule to Schedule Three, where Marinol is synthetic THC. Yeah. Can yeah. Testosterone, um, you know, benign things that are still a pharmaceutical route. Uh, you know, we have to keep the botanical ones with the dispensaries, but uh, having access for physicians to be able to prescribe. All right. But mm -hmm. so EA is the one that can is the one that does the descheduling or rescheduling. And so the HHS and the FDA have written letters to the mm -hmm. DEA to either deschedule or reschedule. 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 Well, we reschedule. Reschedule. Yeah. But DEA has the final authority. I, we we went through this in the 80s. We, from 1986 to 88, we had hearings before the chief administrative law judge of the DEA. We brought forth dozens of patients. We had 34 state laws that had tried to set up these controlled substances, therapeutic research act programs. We had a lot of evidence and doc, and judge Young said, yeah, it should be rescheduled, absolutely. And the DEA rejected that. Well, we went to the Court of Appeals and the Court of Appeals after, well, we went to the Court of Appeals three times, I think. Eventually they said, the DEA has the right, the DEA administrator has the absolute right to schedule or not reschedule. This is what worries me. In, in the regs, the DEA administrator is the final person here. But let's hope, you know, I'm, I'm praying, I'm praying for, uh, I'm praying, <laughs> I'm praying. Dan Mildrum is going to do the right thing. Yeah. Let's hope. Let's no, hope. What a miracle, right? What, we, we need a miracle. And a true miracle is a change of perception. That aha moment when it just makes sense. That's what we're hoping for. Uh -huh. That's what we're hoping for. Yes. Your perception, yeah. cannabis is medicine, period. End of story. <laughs> and then we change the paradigm of healthcare to That's include it. it. Right. Include it. Right. Yeah. Well, I think the federal government is the only one that hasn't admitted that 
cannabis as med is, is medical, but hey, we're working on it. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah. yeah. So let's get back a little bit to Robert's story a little bit, right? Um, okay. You know, Robert became a victim of AIDS, right? In 1995, I think you had told mm -hmm. me. And so let's talk yes. about those days and how you were feeling about the issue and your accomplishments and, and how, and did Robert use medical cannabis for his, for his symptoms? What was, um, what was going well, on? Well, you know, Robert's a very interesting case because he, he probably, um, when he was first diagnosed, which was with AIDS, which was in 94, um, he had very few T cells left. He had 20, I think at that point, you're supposed to have like 2000. Um, but he was 50 pounds overweight. <laughs> He'd been traveling to, to Europe. He'd been doing speaking engagements all around the country. He was not your normal AIDS patient. Um, he did have pneumonia. That's what finally got him to the doctor. Um, and the doctor thought that he had probably been um, infected with AIDS probably in the late seventies, maybe um, was his thinking. So it's kind of a miracle I didn't get it. Uh, apparently there are some people who have a genetic makeup that they can fight off HIV, um, which is pretty amazing. Um, so I never, thankfully I never contracted it, but Robert went through all of this time until 1994. Uh, but when it hit him, it hit him really hard. And he had um, pneumonia, he was quite ill. Um, then his gallbladder, terrible things start happening with his gallbladder. He had all kinds of complications. We decided let's pack it up and go home. Um, let's go home to family. We need, we need more support than, than just Alice can give. Alice needed support. Mm -hmm. Um, it was a very difficult time. I really thought uh, there were two times in, in 1995 that I thought we were going to lose him. Um, but through, um, I can't say it was the miracle of cannabis this time, folks. Um, it was a miracle of good doctoring and good nursing. We had a wonderful uh, nurse um, uh, named Pat Kelly. If you're listening, Pat, thank you. Um, and she she just nursed Robert um, wonderfully. And we also had a wonderful doctor um, who figured out that the problem was he was taking this this medication to not have the pneumonia come back. And it ended up first killing his gallbladder, mm -hmm. and then it went after his pancreas, and his pancreas blew up to the size of like a small football that a kid plays with, and that's and that nearly killed him. Um, but by the time he got through all of this and came out on the other side, the, the new cocktails had arrived, the um, HIV cocktails, AIDS cocktails had arrived, the three medications. And he, he could take two of them. When they added the third, everything went haywire. But he was able to tolerate two of them. And that gave us another six years. We had six really good years in Florida. Um, we were able to write our, our autobiography, which is the Marijuana Rx book. Um, and I'm so grateful for that because... Um, <laughs> Because I forget things and I go to the book and I can remember them. You know, it's a long time ago at this point. And Robert insisted on everything being being in that in that book. And you can see here it is right now. And you can see it's not a short book. It's everything is in this book. And, um, I, you know, I'm so grateful to him for insisting on that because um, it, it's just been such. And then we insisted to the publisher that it have an index. <laughs> so. And for those of you out there who don't know what index is, it's the search feature on a hard copy book. OK, um, so it's been a wonderful resource for me. And that's the book that I've taken recently and made into an EPUB with all of the links that link to the court decisions, to news articles, to the state laws, to articles and pictures about the people that we worked with. Um, and so that was that was a very it was a really good time for us. Um, and uh, I'm I'm just very grateful. Um, Bob so passed away in 2001. 2001. And and something yeah. else happened in 2001. What happened with you? you what happened with me in 2001? Yeah. You returned. You became a nurse to school. I, well, well, no, that was a couple of years later. Okay. Um, I went. Yeah, I went back to. Um, you know, I I 
I needed a break from marijuana. I did. I just, and Robert wasn't there and I just, I needed a break. And my sister said, well, if you could do anything at all, what would it be? And I said, well, I'd work for hospice. Mm -hmm. And she said, well, what's stopping you? And I said, well, I'm not a nurse. She said, well, what's stopping you? So, so I went back to school um, and I was 54 years old. Um, mm -hmm. I went to, I, I'm an LPN. I went to the uh, practical nurse route. I just didn't think I could do three years in college. Um, and, you know, I'm really glad I did that because it, it registered nurses these days. I, God, I love them all, but in hospice at any, for the most part, they're paper pushers. There's a lot of paperwork. Um, yep. I ended up in a hospice house doing patient care, which was what I wanted to do. And I was caring for patients. And honestly, it was just, it was just a wonderful, wonderful experience. And I'm so glad I did that. Then I retired in 2012. People started calling me and saying, hey, will you come here and speak? Will you come there and speak? And I thought, geez, I'd better find out what's going on out there. <laughs> it was a, it was a new universe. It was a whole new universe. So in 2014, I, I threw the dog in the van. We went cross country. I stopped in Denver. That's where I met the good folks at Mary's Medicinals, um, Nicole and Lynn. Um, met Nurse Marcy and um, met a lot of wonderful people there. Then up to Oregon to um, the Patients Out of Time conference. Met more wonderful people, learned a lot and um, ended up working with Mary's Medicinals for five years as their ambassador and, uh, and their educational program, as you've already mentioned. Yeah, it was wonderful. I, I've had a wonderful life, I really have. It's just been extraordinary. I, I love Mary's Medicinals and I love the, the primer that you, that you built for them. That was uh, some of the early work that trained me. <laughs> uh, well, thank you, thank you. I love doing it and uh, you know, they would print up thousands of copies and give them to the dispensaries and they just went out everywhere. I was amazed at how far, how far and wide it went. It was great. It was great. And then the, the Mary's prime prime time, I was going to conferences literally around the world and reporting on these conferences because, Oh my God, the research during that time was coming left and right, left and right. It still is. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so that was fun too, to be able to report on that and tell people, what the, what the scientists were doing it was um this this move this this plant is i i talk i speak of it as as the universe it it's constantly going outward learning more showing more you know displaying more to us it's um uh, it's just a wonderful wonderful thing to to have been involved in and it's so wonderful that you have stepped back into the space and are Thank continuing you. Educate and are continuing, you know, to bring legacy historical. It's legacy work, historical <laughs> medical legacy work to the forefront mm -hmm. with information that has been missing for so long. So I want to share our your website. Like um, Please, first. yeah. yeah. <laughs> People find you and 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 shop and buy the primer, buy the yeah. book, buy the everything. Oh my God. There it is. There it is. Medical cannabis. Oracle Memorial Memorabilia Store. And there's a link yeah. below in the show notes where that you can go. Okay. This is Alice O'Leary Randall's page, her shop, mm -hmm. Home Resources, mm -hmm. the Santa Cruz Movement, Project 50, Robert and Alice, the Memory Blog, and the Memorabilia Store. Let's look, take a peek at some of this stuff here. <laughs> Groundhog Day is one of Robert's favorite holidays to learn why. Visit the memory blog to celebrate mm -hmm. all memorabilia products are on sale for the month of February, 50% off everything. Use the discount code hog. <laughs> <Woo -hoo>. but, <laughs> yeah, we have, go. There's the PDF. Yep. We have the yeah. book. And so we have yeah. the book here. Then yes, you have, and, and let's talk about some these of this are, stuff. Yeah. These are little monographs that just tell little stories. Um, and they're very, they're, they're short, easy to digest. And these these are all available EPUB um, or hard copy. So, yeah. And, and tell then me the tins it. are <laughs> the tins are a big favorite. I I have one right here. Um, so, quick mm -hmm. yeah, look at that tin. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Three hundred yeah. people. Tin. Tin. Yes. Yep. And uh, you know, by the way, it wasn't very good marijuana in that 
that Good Morning America thing, he says the government's marijuana is pretty good. His opinion changed on that over the years. Um, and it was it it was never really any higher than 2.6% THC content, which is so laughable in today's world. Um, mm-hmm. But it saved his sight. He, he still had his sight at the time of his death. And that's 20 years. Wow. So it may have been low THC, um, but it did the job. So yeah. I think that's important for your for, for medical users that, you know, we don't you don't have to get to that high THC stuff. In fact, that can be very detrimental to you. So um, yeah. yep. therapeutic you use know. of cannabis. We need to find the balance, right? We don't want to do right. THC. What happens? Your body says, oh, I don't need to make my own anandamide. So what am I going to do? My receptors are going to hide, right? So we yeah. want to. The goal of taking cannabis is to do what? To function. Tune the ECS. <laughs> Tune the ECS. To function. Yeah. A cell yeah. signal. I like it. Exactly. It's to function. Yeah. <laughs> our best yeah. So Alice, this has been an absolutely amazing show. We we did have a couple oh. slides to show, but I'm, I'm we don't need to show them because we've covered so much. You've really okay. been an amazing right. guest. I'm so grateful. Oh, thank you. you. Thank you. That's been fun. I've really enjoyed it. Oh, so it's good. great to spend some time with you too. Yeah. Oh, good. I'm so, so glad. I'm yeah. so glad. Yeah. So this show is going to be, this is on YouTube. It's been streamed on multiple different platforms. Um, don't hang up. We're going to, I'm going to just close out the show and, um, okay. and we'll have you back on because I think there's some more work that yeah. we need to do for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, you, okay. you are a wealth of knowledge and I know our viewers would greatly appreciate to hear from you yeah. as well. I'd love to do it. Of course. Right. You right. got it. All right. And, and so this wraps up. Thank you very up. much episode of The Green Nurse, Living Your Best Life. Remember everyone what it's all about. It's all about living your best life and helping others do the same. And I'm just going to end again with one little video that's one of my favorites on hope, inspiration, growth, and healing. We're here to educate and empower patients to make choices that are best for them. We're also here to decrease stigma around what it means to feel good and be high. Hence the H for hope, I for inspiration, G for growth, and H for healing. The Green Nurse is a holistic cannabis nurse that teaches on the endocannabinoid system in the safe utilization of cannabis and other progressive tools to help people reach a better quality of life. I was cannabis agnostic for many, many years. And you know, the more research I did, the more I discovered the cannabis is this amazing medicine. I was told that I had a four-stage pancreatic cancer. The doctor really told me he couldn't do anything else. He gave me her name and she called me and she came to my house. She started to give me cannabis. My oncologist was puzzled because he couldn't find the cancer anymore. All of the learning that we get yeah. comes from the Green Nurses Group, comes from their support, comes from their guidance. I trust everything that she says. Simply meet people where they're at. The plant doesn't, you know, stress to grow, so we don't stress to share it. We're healing people. Cannabis has been used as a medicine for tens upon thousands of years. Here's the big message. Cannabis needs to be federally legal. We need to have laws that are the same across all 50 states that allow access to anyone and everyone who wants to utilize this powerful medicine.